Hello everyone and welcome back to another brand new episode of Collider Mailbag. I'm Dennis. I'm Perry. I'm still standing. <laughs> Yes, as you can see, we are still standing. Also, we are here to talk about uh, questions that people have sent in. How do you do that? You email us at collidervideo at gmail.com. We answer on today's show, tomorrow's show, sometimes on the movie talk show if if there's enough time for that. Yep. Yeah. But so we, we, we get first dibs. Yes. So, yes. yeah, I want to get We get the good ones. We get the good ones. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> they're all good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the first question we have up for today's episode is. Uh, Seth Tarboro, and he writes, Hey gang, I've been watching you guys since the AMC days, but this is the first time I've sent in a question, so I hope you use it. With the Oscars approaching, I wanted to create a new award, Best Scene. If you had to award one scene out of all the movies in 2017, who would you give it to? My vote would be the musical number in The Shape of Water. Thanks, MTFBWY, hashtag Outlaw Nation. So, Perry, what would be your scene of the year? This is an easy one for me because I've said it on multiple videos. My favorite scene of 2017 was the Michael Stuhlbarg scene in Call Me By Your Name. It was just a scene that spoke to me on so many levels. It was the scene that on my drive home from my first screening was just going in circles in my mind. It completely changed the ending of that movie for me in a really powerful way. And it also is something, it comes with a message that I can apply to my own life. I can apply to how I look at other people and what they love. And mm. I just really, really, that, that scene struck me more so than not even just any other scene in 2017. It's one of my most memorable scenes for you know the last few years, let's say. But that scene is definitely my number one, and I really do wish that Michael Stuhlbarg got a little more recognition from the Academy this year, because when you think about him and his work in Call Me By Your Name, Shape of Water, he did a lot with a little in the post. I wish that role was beefed up a little more, but he makes a really great impression in Call Me By Your Name and Shape of Water. Okay, I have a confession. Confession oh. time. Oh no! I still have not seen Call Me By... It's... it's it... I'm planning on seeing it. I will see it before the Oscars, but it's it's not readily available or accessible. I okay. think I think right before the Oscars, they probably will put it back into theaters. It's you in, think, it or, is in theaters. It is? It's in okay. select theaters. Okay, in select theaters, but it's not like I can go down over to we the Burbank, Burbank 16 and go watch Maybe it, Maybe not right? the Burbank 16, okay. but there are many Burbank movie theaters. I'll, I'll seek out a screening for okay. you if you promise you'll go. No, no I, I promise I'll go because I have to watch it. We're going to yeah. do the Oscar. We're going to have our live Oscar show like usual. We're going to talk about all the Oscar. I have to see it. I will see it. I just haven't fine, yet. Fine, okay. fine. Uh, for, for me, it's something I always talked about. Of It's from my favorite movie of last year, Logan. Mm -hmm. It's uh, the dinner scene and then what happens after, which yeah. is which is Logan takes Professor X up the, up the stairs. He carries him up there, and as he lays Professor X down, Prof Professor X tells him, he's like, you know, this is what life looks like, and he tells him, you should take a moment and feel the mo like what it's like. And and it's just kind of a heartbreaking scene to me because to me it's it's, it's this thing where it's what ultimately Logan would want, but I think he knows that this is so temporary that he kind of rejects it. He doesn't want to accept that. He doesn't even want it for a moment to, to at least be happy for just that moment because he knows that it's going to go away. Yeah. So he's like, what's the point? It's such a you tragic know? conversation. Yes, and then with what happens later on with Professor X and, yeah. and, and the rest of the movie. So I want to give... Oh, keep oh go, no, no, go ahead. Go I ahead. wanted to give an honorable mention before we moved on. Oh, sure. I... Tanya. Okay. I, Tanya, there's two scenes and they both involve Alice and Janney. And I'm not, I, I don't want to spoil exactly what they are, but I will say one involves a knife. You, have you seen yes, I, Tanya? Yes, okay. I've what, seen the I, knife Tanya. scene. And then another one that involves a recorder. And those okay. scenes were, again, I'll use the word powerful again, because mm -hmm. that's pretty much the only way I can describe it, especially that second scene without spoiling exactly what's going on. Yes. And I highly recommend checking that movie out. And Allison Janney is really deserving of all the recognition she's getting, because even though Lavana is, uh, I would say, a straightforward villain type mm -hmm. character to a degree, she brings so much nuance to that role that makes those scenes in particular 
really interesting to watch, especially that second one, because the second one diverted my expectations in ways that I didn't think was possible that late in the game in that movie. Okay. Second. Wait, now I cut you off. What were you no, going to no. say before? I, I don't remember, but I have se second confession okay. time. Okay. Second confession. Right now, I'm like deeply into the, the Winter Olympics. I'm watching all the figure skating stuff. I love stuff. the Winter Olympics. So I, like, I watched like the pears, the, the ice dancing. You were watching the dancing. The ice dancing, okay. which I didn't even know was a thing. I, I was like, I was like, why aren't they doing any tricks? And then it was like, oh, ice dancing is different from figure skating. Yeah. And then, and then now I'm watching the the women's the women's single. I watch the yeah, hockey yeah. every morning because the hockey. Okay. You know, I get up at like five five yeah. thirty every morning, and the hockey is almost always what's live then. So I watch a lot of that. But so my mom and my sister are super into the ice skating, yes. and I'm aware of the traditional programs, but I never really watched any of the ice dancing either. And it comes on the beginning of the programs and whatever mm -hmm. you know track they have to do to get to the final uh, the final event yeah. within that medal, and I'm like. You know, th this isn't for me. Mm -hmm. I don't really like watching this. And then before I knew it, I had spent <laughs> hours watching everybody's program yes. in that particular event. Then I tuned in the next day, and then the next oh, they, day. Oh, they get you with the short program, and then you have to watch the free skate the the next of day. Of course. And you saw there was like from the U.S. They have the the brother and sister yeah. the, duo. The, what's their nickname? The, the Shib Shib Shibs. Shibs. Yeah, Shib Sibs. So they they, <laughs> they won the bronze. They won the bronze. So good on them. So you, you you mentioned I Tanya, which is you know okay. Tanya already. I can I talk about yeah. the Olympics all yeah. day too. So this is not Olympics mailbag. So we will move <laughs> on to the next question. Now I wish I picked yeah. an Olympics question for tomorrow. <laughs> all right. Oh, I'm reading the next one. Uh, the next question comes from Giovanna, who writes, Hello, Collider. You're my favorite YouTube channel, and I tune in every day. My question is, do you think Marvel puts extra pressure on themselves with massive numbers, like we saw for Black Panther and other Marvel titles? If so, do you think it's good or bad for the producers and directors to always have such weight on their shoulders? With this one, it's not a matter of Marvel putting that mm -hmm. on themselves. It's just the name of the game, whether we're talking about Marvel or even, let's say, Transformers. And I don't think Transformers <laughs> has that pressure with quality, but when you deliver movies that give such a big uh, draw at the box office and make so much money for a studio, because look at the position that Paramount has put itself in. Mm -hmm. It relied on Transformers as its major money maker for a really long time, and now it doesn't have something like that. So now Paramount is definitely feeling the pressure of their extreme success in that franchise. With Marvel, it is the name of the game, especially when you're talking about a long-running cinematic mm -hmm. universe or franchise. You always want to continue raising the bar and keep people coming back to see your movies, your different movies, your better movies. And that just means that down the line, we're going to have to continually get better and better movies. And yeah, that puts a lot of weight on the director and the actor's shoulders because you may hear, oh, so-and-so is cast in a Marvel movie. Lucky them, that's a great get for your career. But with all of that comes a significant amount of risk because especially when you are the face of the movie or you are the person at the helm of the movie, if that movie does not meet fans' expectations, everyone's gonna be looking at you. Yeah, I, I definitely think that Marvel does have that pressure added weight. The the one thing I would say, and I will relate it to sports again, is that because they're on such a win streak, they have all that confidence. Yeah. So it's even though that pressure is there, it's lessened because they're so confident in the in. Look, if you look at all the Marvel Studio movies, you know we can always debate quality or whatnot, but at least financially, they're batting one thousand. There's not a single Marvel movie that's didn't make yeah. a significant amount of money. Some obviously made more than others. You have Black Panther that did phenomenal, and you'll have the next ones, and maybe the next one won't do as much, but it will probably most likely do well. So at that point, when you have that kind of confidence, you, you have that kind of wins going into it. it the, even though the pressure's there, it's, it's less, where if you're with another franchise and maybe it's, it's hit and miss, you're like, oh, People are really looking 
at this one. Mm -hmm. Also just the nature of what we do and the internet and just yes. the constant conversation, which I'm super thankful that we get to do things like this, given how much this industry has grown over the years. But that also puts added pressure because everything is under a microscope. And now the second they release a clip online, you could basically freeze frame and analyze every stitch of that footage before a movie even comes out. It's just, it's pressure coming from so many angles. Yeah. All right, moving on to the next question. We have Aqua Panther, and he writes, greetings from Ohio, Collider Crew. I wanted to ask you a question. My friends and I were discussing a few days ago. How many performances does it take to be classified as a good actor? On one hand, you have someone like Millie Bobby Brown, who is great as she is, as great as she is, is in Stranger Things. It's only one role we've seen her in. On the other hand, you have someone like Hayden Christensen, who people acknowledge was good in Shattered Glass, but nobody considers him to be a good actor because of the rest of his body of work. So what is your take on the topic? Thanks for taking my question and have a great day. I don't think you can narrow it down to a specific number and say, oh, once you've hit that many, you can or cannot be considered a good actor. And the example of Millie Bob Bobby Brown comes up often because really Stranger Things propelled her to an insane level of stardom where, you know, she's in the new Godzilla movie. She's producing a film franchise that hopefully will get off the ground soon because I'm curious to see how that pans out. But with her, I, and I have heard, because I've only seen her in Stranger Things, and I have heard she was good in that show, Intruders, mm -hmm. so I do want to make time to go and just see what she was like in that, but it, it looks to me, based on Stranger Things, like she has a lot of potential, but I don't think you can say, oh, and I've seen Millie Bobby Brown perform in three things that will, in my mind, say she is a good actor, but you also have to consider, even if someone does have a an extensive body of work where, let's say a new actor has racked up five films. Mm -hmm. If it's five films in the same exact genre doing the same exact thing, that still doesn't say to me, oh, that person has a lot of range. And that is very important when it comes to longevity of career, especially, you know, I'm thinking about Melissa McCarthy. When she first started out and became a very wide known, I'm talking about a very widespread name, yeah. she was well known for her role in Bridesmaids. And then she did something similar in a whole bunch of movies after that. And it wasn't until later on when I saw uh, even Spy, even though it's similar, but also St. Vincent. And with a movie that she's got coming out later this year, which is much more of a heavy drama, you want to see both quantity and continued continued success in terms of being in good movies and delivering good work, but also a wide variety of genres and styles of performances. Yeah, someone similar to that was uh, Vince Vaughn. Vince Vaughn, once he became popular with old school, he kind of repeated that same role mm -hmm. over and over again. He got, got kind of typecasted. And, but actually, I had seen some of his previous work. Uh, I forgot, there was a movie he did with Joaquin Phoenix that was called... I want to say like Stranger in Paradise or something like that. Stranger's Paradise. It's where he's like he like goes to another country and he, he hangs out with Joaquin Phoenix and then they get busted for mm. drugs. And then they they, they put uh, Anne Hesh is in that movie. I forgot you the name a lot of the of movie. Details for that movie. Yeah, for not knowing the but title. but it's a drama and yeah. he he actually does a really good job in that. And so my my thing is and it's similar to what you're saying about, about ranges. I'd say the least amount is two things with the cat two two roles whether it's television or movies with the caveat that the role is at least somewhat different from what they what you normally see them play mm -hmm. so it's not like hey they're playing this character and then they go to another show or or movie and they're playing basically the same character that they were playing before. So it's like hopefully Millie Bobby Brown's character in the new Godzilla movie isn't someone that gets notes, please. Yes. Otherwise, yes. just more of the same. Yeah. Or, or causes people to, you know, fly about and, you know, uh, all, all that kind of stuff. All right, let's move on to the next question. All right, this next one is very small to read on that screen, so I'm going to read it from here. Hey, Collider crew, I've been thrilled by Black Panther's degree of box office success, but it's caused me to think about Wonder Woman's opening weekend again. Comparing their first three days, Black Panther made about twice as much as Wonder Woman. This seems strange to me, considering how many similarities there are between the context of these two films. Both characters were cinematically introduced with Versus movies about a year before their solo films. Both films had critical acclaim with Rotten Tomatoes scores above 90%. 
percent. Both star characters of demographics underrepresented in recent superhero films, and both characters are slash were set to star in a huge team up movie a few months after their solo film. Yet Black Panther earned about $98.5 million more than Wonder Woman. Is the branding of the DCEU just that much worse than the MCU? Was the marketing that much better for BP? Did the black community rally around Black Panther in a way that female audiences didn't for Wonder Woman, which factor do you think made the biggest difference? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Don't forget to be awesome from Aiden. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure Dennis sabotaged this video, so I had to read that entire yes, question. Yes. But but really, uh, kudos to Aiden for, for all the thoughtful analysis and just bringing to light all these connections, which are very valid. And it's a good point to make. What do you think, Dennis? Yeah, for me, it, it's actually all three of the things that he mentions. He mentions branding. He says, uh, M like Marvel versus DC branding. Then also marketing as well. And then also the movement. I mean, mm -hmm. I think there was a bigger push behind the movement for Black Panther than there was for Wonder Woman. That kind of came in later, a little mm -hmm. late to the game. And, and it just shows how big and how, how uh, I don't know how to say it, how much the Marvel brand has become like almost like pr printing money because whoever thought Black Panther would have made in four days what Justice League made in its entire domestic run. That's that's crazy. That's well, I that's certainly unheard of. Wouldn't, no, no, as that's... everybody well knows, I was more than a like if you go back to my first box office yeah. prediction for Black Panther, it was more than a hundred million dollars off of what it made. Yeah, but I mean it, it's crazy though. A Batman, a movie with Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, and Flash does that in their entire run, and Black Panther d does it in four. Black Panther is, is a movie that, or not a movie, a character that not that many people were familiar with before this movie. Mm -hmm. And, and it is, it's another case where Marvel was able to achieve this because of their brand. Let's think about Doctor Strange or Guardians of the Galaxy. All these characters that nobody knows about, but because they've seen the other Marvel movies yeah. and they know what they're get in for, they're willing to take that chance. Where with DC, they were coming off of Batman v Superman. I think Wonder Woman would have been in a much better position if Batman v Superman w did a lot better and was much more well received by both critics and fans. Mm -hmm. And then going into Wonder Woman, they wouldn't have been as gun shy. I felt like they almost were like concerned, like are are, are people gonna like it? Like with Black Panther, Marvel knew people were gonna like it, so they amped up the marketing, they amped up everything, where Wonder Woman, they were like, oh, I don't know, is it? And they kind of like mm -hmm. towards, like maybe two or three weeks before Wonder Woman came out, they're like, oh, okay, I think people are gonna like this, let's start going yeah. with it. Yeah, I will say that with Wonder Woman, I think they had a brilliant embargo lifting strategy mm -hmm. where, you know, most of the time you can figure out, depending on when an embargo lifts, what people think. It's just the way they did it where they had a whole bunch of people go see an, uh, a very early screening and then they lifted the social embargo mm -hmm. and then at just the right time, they got a whole nother wave of full reviews that gave it even more momentum going into its opening weekend. But back to addressing this question and actually first addressing something you said specifically, mm -hmm. and I'm not using this to compare Marvel to DC mm -hmm. as a film franchise or a company, but I do want to give Marvel a lot of credit because they They've earned the, the ability to be in this position right now. They've set the foundation that they can explore lesser known characters. They can focus on underrepresented people in the film in the film industry right now and be able to put them on screen and bring a lot of attention to them because they have a, they've established themselves as a given to a certain degree. They have that foundation and now they're using it as a platform to do different things and to, I mean, all the achievements that Black Panther is going has already acquired mm -hmm. and will eventually lead to with other movies is astounding and it's something that should be repeated and celebrated. Looking at all these examples here of why this might have happened, I think a lot of them are very accurate to varying degrees. What, what I do focus in on though is that what I just said, Marvel was the better established brand going into this movie, but I will also say that I think Black Panther caught the Wonder Woman wave a little yeah. because when Wonder Woman came out, on, under representation for female led superhero movies was was a hot topic yes. and people kept talking about it and look at how much we were talking about Wonder Woman well after its release into award season where yeah it didn't get any academy award nominations but tons of guilds tons of uh, 
individual top 10 list featured heavily Wonder Woman. We were still talking about it, and we are still talking about it to this day. So I think Black Panther being positioned however many months after all that hype from Wonder Woman mm -hmm. positioned it in the best possible way where it could use that as an even stronger springboard to make more money on its own. I'm not saying that's the only reason that it made as much money as it did compared to Wonder Woman, but I do think it got a boost from that. I, I think it did get a boost, but I will say this. I was going to bring this up earlier about the movement. I think with Wonder Woman, you, you did have a lot of women come out in support of it and became a thing, but you didn't get the whole widespread type of uh, backing. Like, okay, so for example, you're not seeing, like I've been watching all these videos with, with Black Panther. You have Will Smith, who's in, in the opposite. He's in, DC, in the DC universe. Yeah. He's sending thank you videos talking about how awesome Black Panther is. So you're getting like bigger name stars like coming out supporting it, mm -hmm. where with Wonder Woman, it's not like I saw, I didn't see videos of like, I don't know, Meryl Streep going, hey, I, Wonder Woman's great, go, you know, go check it out. I, I didn't see that full, like the whole spectrum of yeah. people where with Black Panther, I am seeing the black community, it's like all the way, you know, from, from all the people on the top. I didn't see it to that same extent, but I, I did see it. Mm -hmm. I, I looked at tons of pictures on Instagram of folks getting dressed up to go to a Black Panther screening. I saw the same thing, especially with uh, young girls mm -hmm. going to see Wonder Woman, being dressed up as Wonder Woman, taking pictures in front of the poster and the pose, all that kind of stuff. I do think that it, it still connects to kind of the point that I brought up before mm -hmm. with that was that was this big of a movement yeah. when Wonder Woman came out, and now that folks have seen people do that for Wonder Woman, yeah. they're even more inclined to do it for Black Panther because they saw it before. It's in more people's minds because there was more awareness of it then, and now it's going to be taken to an even greater extent. And hopefully, that means when another movie like this comes out, it's going to grow even more. Yeah. So we shall see. Yeah, definitely, Wonder Woman helped the momentum with Black Panther. Yeah. So. All right, uh, moving on to the last question. We Ooh. have uh, Daniel Kelly, and he writes, Hey there, guys and gals at Collider. Big fan, fan from the UK. Daily viewer and loving the content you're making. My question is, has a movie ever put you off on anything? I know Jaws is a famous example. Mine is Sunbeds after Final Des Destination 2. Thanks, the pale Danny Milhouse. <laughs> okay, first. Okay. Daniel, I love this question because you bring up Final Destination, but I will have to correct you. The tanning bed sequence was in Final Destination 3, okay. not Final Destination 2, but Final Destination 2 is my favorite movie of that entire franchise. I love that and jumping off of that, so I would never, I don't like tanning in general, so no. I wouldn't go in a tanning bed, but definitely not after seeing that movie, but also you can't drive on the freeway behind a gigantic truck with logs in it and not think of Final Destination 2. And I mean, my mind keeps going to horror movies to answer this question. The other thing that really creeps me out is things that happen to people's Achilles heel in, or like the tendons in the uh -huh. back of your ankle. Like, you ever see the, the House of Wax remake when they, when they clip the back of his ankle? It freaks me out. And now that spot on, on my own ankle freaks me out. Uh, for me, it's something that, that I, that has gone away, but when I was younger, it was in Stand By Me, the, the pie eating contest. Oh, okay. That was so gross to me <laughs> and disgusting that like there was, it was a long period of time before I ate pie. Pie? Yeah. I don't like, I'm not a big pie fan, but that but scene that, grossed me out. Yeah, <laughs> so it was, you know, it, that's a pretty gross thing. Uh, anything else? I would never have uh, chewing tobacco because of the sandlot. Okay. That that always that that's an even gross. So Stand by Me is vomit sequence. Mm -hmm. At least has a, a comedic kind of vibe to it. Mm -hmm. The Stand by the the uh, Sandlot one was a little grosser though. Uh -huh. So yeah, um, uh, I'll go with that one. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of different stuff in in movies that you kind of watch and then suddenly, but for different reasons, right? One is either it scares you, yeah, grosses you out. Or if it's something maybe that just kind of annoys you or, or turns you off, you're like, eh. Or maybe you hear a song in a movie, maybe that's used in a way that you don't, you know, okay, like, this isn't turned off, but like, the way that Clockwork Orange uses Singing mm -hmm. in the Rain now, I can only think of Singing in the Rain in Clockwork Orange okay. instead of where it originated, which was Singing in the Rain. It's like uh, in Insidious, uh, tiptoe through the tulips. I'll never oh. hear that the same way ever again after seeing it in Insidious. Cause, and a lot of horror movies do that, where they'll take something that 
that doesn't have a sinister yes. vibe to it. And then the second you put that song in a scary movie, it takes on a completely different form. Yeah. All right, guys, that's it for this episode of Collider Mailbag. Thanks for joining us. Perry, where can people find you? Twitter and Instagram at P. Nemiroff. You guys can find me at Think Hero on Twitter and Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. And we'll see you guys next time. Hey, everybody, Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode. You want to watch more? Then click up here. Or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. If you haven't subscribed to Collider Video, do so right now and share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.